Good morning. Welcome to day two of Hands On. Thank you so much for yesterday. We had some really great discussions, and uh, I got, we've got some really, really interesting feedback. So thanks to all of you for, for being such an important part of yesterday. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker for the day, Robert Watt, Mr. Robert Watt. I learned some new words yesterday, and I will try to pronounce them. Patcher's Strop, Dilly, and Mortar Mill. Sue's telling me I've got those sort of right. These may be unfamiliar terms for most of us, and certainly for me, but not for our next speaker. Robert Watt is president of RJW Gem Campbell Stonemasons, which is conducting a massive restoration project in Parliament Hill. A former apprentice in Scotland, Mr. Watt and his company are training more than 60 apprentices in this major Parliament Hill project. Please welcome Mr. Roger Watt. Robert, sorry, Robert. Oh my God, Robert, Robert. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we'll dispense with the formality. Only my wife calls me Robert and only when I'm in shit. <laughs> my name's Bobby, or Bob. Um, and once we get the sound settled into somewhere close to what sounds like my voice, we'll, we'll begin. I'm a very lucky man. I'm a stonemason. And a lot of people don't quite understand what stonemason is. In fact, this whole country doesn't understand what stonemason is. Because there's nothing from one side of the country to the other that says stonemason. In Ontario, it's brick and stonemason. They don't even have the designation in, in uh, Saskatchewan. It's bricklayer. But I'm going to explain to you what a stonemason is and what a stonemason does and how you get to be a stonemason. And we'll start with a joke because all good talks start with a joke. And because we're in Canada and it's approaching winter, we'll start with a winter joke. <laughs> so there's a little polar bear on an ice floe with his dad. And he's tugging his daddy's far and he says, Daddy, am I a real polar bear? And the big bear looks down and he says, of course you're a polar bear, son. The little bear looks up, Daddy, maybe I'm a koala bear. He says, no. He says, well, maybe I'm a black bear or a grizzly bear. Maybe I'm even one of them teddy bears I hear about. He says, no, you're a polar bear, son. Look at you, you're a big, strong boy, nice white fur. Lovely black shiny nose, you're a polar bear. He says, why are you asking all these silly questions? He says, the little bear says, Daddy, I'm freezing. <laughs> so we could translate that into masonry. We really can. Big stone mason and an apprentice stone mason. The son of the big stone mason. The apprentice stone mason says, Daddy, are you sure I'm a mason? Are you sure I'm a stone mason? And the big mason says, yes, of course you are. The guy says, maybe I'm a bricklayer. No, you're not a bricklayer. Maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a tile setter. No, you're not a tile setter. You're a mason. Well, maybe I'm a concrete guy, concrete finisher. No, 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 you're a mason. Look at you. Big, strong boy, big shoulders, nice blue eyes. <laughs> handsome in a craggy sort of way. <laughs> you're a stonemason. He says, why are you asking all these silly questions? He says, well, Daddy, nobody in Canada seems to know what the hell a stonemason is. <laughs> <clears throat> Stone. Mason. Masson de Pierre in French. When I was 16, I got out of high school in Scotland in a beautiful island of Arran off the southwest coast and was lying on the couch one Saturday morning wondering what to do with the rest of my life. Now, in Scotland, the education system is such that you spend longer days in school and have less time off in the summertime. So you come out with grade 12 equivalent at 16. And apprenticeship in the British system is a very, very formal and... and uh, well gradiated way of moving forward in your life. There's always the two streams. There's two streams all over the world. The rich go to university, the poor don't go to university, they go into the trades. And the trades are a viable option for people in the British Isles. I had thought I wanted to be an airframe mechanic. My dad said, well, you don't want to do that because to do that, get the best training, you're going to have to join the Air Force. If you join the Air Force, I can't afford to buy you out. And these days in 1970, um, if you joined the British Armed Forces and they trained you for a time, then you decided you didn't like it. You had to pay them back all the money they'd spent on you. And, of course, they jacked the money up to suit themselves. So my dad, working in the post office, as he did, didn't have enough money to buy me out. So he says, please don't join the Armed Forces or else you'll bankrupt the family. <laughs> so then I wanted to be a, I thought I'd be a motor mechanic because I enjoyed, with my father, I enjoyed tinkering about with our old Morris Minor and... and uh, in Mini Cooper and uh, changing engines and stuff. So I thought maybe I'll be a motor mechanic, but my uncle Will, 
who lived around the corner, says, don't. She says, look at my hands. She says, 30 years as a motor mechanic, my hands are filthy. It's before the days of these blue plastic gloves they all wear nowadays. Um, he said, don't be a motor mechanic. So I had a pal at school, a guy called Ian Thompson, and his father ran a stonemasonry company on the island. And I thought, well, maybe that'd be kind of nice. So my father made some discreet inquiries. <clears throat> and uh, he came in to me one Saturday morning. He says, I was talking to, to John Thompson, he says. And he's looking for an apprentice. And I said, wow, wow. So I was just talking to Ian about that last week. He says, well, you can start on Monday morning. So on the Monday morning, you arrive at the pier. You, everybody in, in Aaron gets picked up at the local jetty, the pier closest to the water. It's on an island 20 miles by 12. Beautiful place. 3,000 foot high range of mountains on the, on the north end and rolling hills on the south end. Beautiful sandy beaches. But the pier is the focal point of, the, of each of the villages. Down to the pier on the Monday morning, and I'm expecting to go somewhere else on the island to work. And he says, this is John Thompson, my boss. He says, you're going to work right there at the end of the pier. And at the end of the pier was a little coastal vessel, a puffer, we called them, steam engines. And it was, had 225,000 bricks in it, all packed singly. And on the western islands of Scotland, they used to bring the stuff out from Glasgow. They'd bring brick and coal and anthracite, lime for the fields, um, other building materials, although not very much other building materials. Um, but they'd go out empty, or they'd come, they'd, instead of coming back empty, they'd bring whiskey back in. So they'd go out with a load of bricks or coal or whatever it was out to the islands, and they'd come back in with whiskey, which was a good way of doing things, I thought. <laughs> and so I was charged with getting in that boat with 225,000 bricks in it with another 16-year-old, and two at a time, picking them up and putting them in a bucket. And the bucket stood about yay high, and the derrick would take it up to the edge of the pier where the bucket would get dumped into the back of a truck. And there was another bucket that had to be filled before the first bucket came back down. Back-breaking work. You're in a hold, probably the width of the stage all the way to the back room, and the pile of bricks in the hold would be 14 feet high. You're in the middle of the pile, work your way down to the bottom of the pile, and then work both ways. First to the bow of the boat, and then to the stern of the boat. Took us a week to empty the boat. My hands, my nails were split, my hands were bleeding. We learned to cut rubber, bits of rubber in our tube to cover our fingers. It was horrendous. And it was in the middle of a Scottish summer, so it was sometimes six or seven degrees. <laughs> it was <laughs> one of these things, you know. And Mike and I, the other kid and I, looked at each other. Jeez, that was hellish. Absolutely hellish. So we got up, we got our pay packet. First paycheck, three pounds, three shillings and threepence for a week's work, about eight bucks for a week's work, 1970. And I said to John, I said, he's given me my pay packet. I said to John, I said, my goodness, I said, uh, that was really hard. I wasn't really complaining, but uh, John, that was really hard. He said, don't worry about it, he says. You're going to Lamlash on Monday. Different place altogether, N next village, over the hill, next village. Great, thanks a bunch. Picked me up on Monday, took me to the Malaysia. There was another boat sitting at the end of the pier. <laughs> another 225,000 bricks. And I went, Jesus. You had two choices, and John's standing there looking at me. And I said, okay. Down the end of the pier, into the boat, another week. He told me years later that if I hadn't walked down that pier, that would have been done. No apprenticeship. After that was done, we had all the joy in the world, him and I. He taught me. This guy was one of the most famous masons in Scotland. When he came back from the Second World War, he was one of the crew that demolished a cathedral-sized church called St. James's to make way for the new motorway that was to connect Glasgow and Edinburgh. They took it down six million stones. They took it down, numbered every one of them, moved it two and a half miles and rebuilt it. An amazing feat of masonry, restoration, engineering, um, Insight, a beautiful church. It still stands today and will stand for another 300 years. It's a beautiful church. He was one of the youngest foremen on the job, and we'll come back to that later. But the first thing that John taught me when we're driving about the island, there was only, there was only him and another guy, a guy called Jock Kerr. These two were really fine, fine stonemasons. And he decided that because I was coming into what was a new world to him, they were starting to build houses. He'd spent most of his time building stone and working on Brodick Castle. And indeed, I spent a lot of time on Brodick Castle myself in my apprenticeship. Brodick Castle started in the 13th century, finished in the, in the 18th century. Beautiful stone building, and we spent a lot of time restoring it and, and adjusting, making adjustments to it. 
But John was starting to get into housing. He wanted a bricklayer. So what I would do is I'd spend three weeks of my month learning stone from two of the greatest guys ever. And then I'd spend a week of a month in Glasgow learning brick. So it was a perfect solution. And that's why I'm a lucky man. It was a perfect thing for what I do now. A perfect. It couldn't have been a better training ground for what I do now. And I was very proud to be a stonemason. Why? Because he would tell you stories. He would tell me stories about not only his exploits, but his master mason's exploits. A guy called Bob Logan. Now, Bob Logan in 1890, when he was a young man at 21, built a bridge um, across the Blackwater River, which is on the other side of the island from us, where my father was born, actually, in the village where my father was born. And the bridge is still standing today. It has never seen a repointing job. It has never seen another hammer and chisel or trowel apart from Bob Logan's. 125 years old, it's never had to be repointed. There's a picture of it in my office at, at the West Block at Parliament Hill. And all of the kids, all of the apprentices that come through me, all of the, 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 my foremen now that were apprentices with me 15, 20 years ago, know the story of that bridge. And they know the story of Bob Logan when he, when he was getting his, more kids than, he, than his house could handle. And he said he was going to have to put a second story on the house. It was a stone-built bungalow with walls as thick as this table. How is he going to lift this slate roof? Massive slate roof. How is he going to lift this thing up? Thinking outside the box, cut little pockets that size all around the house at three feet centers. Now this is about 1948 or 50. Not very many cars on the island. Still a lots, lots and lots of horses and traps. We had our milk when I was a kid delivered by a horse and trap, still then. He got every bottle jack from every car on the island that he could manage and he stuck them all in these little pockets. And then he went to the pub on a Sunday afternoon in the village and he dragged all the guys out the pub with, with promises of free whiskey and he dragged them all back to his house half a mile along the road and he put them in, on chairs and on benches and various things and together they jacked the house roof up 18 inches and he built in underneath it two feet wide thick walls he built in underneath it and then three or four Sundays later he got them all back for free whiskey again and they let it all back down on the top all together thinking outside the box and all my guys know that story this is how you build pride in being an apprentice. This is how you build pride in knowing and understanding the 6,000 odd years of masonry history that's come along behind. And mason means stone. This word mason has been hijacked by the unions. When people say mason in all of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, when people say mason, the other part of their brain is saying stone, stone mason. It's one word, it's not two words. It's only one capital. Yes. All of you will remember that from here on in, won't you? <laughs> Never ever write stonemason as two words ever again. One word. So, and Cocky had some very serious tricks of his own. When I first went up to Parliament Hill, and I'm getting off, you'll find me rambling a bit here. It's all right. It's fine, we'll get back to the business sooner or later. When I first went up to Parliament Hill, 1996, we were tasked with taking the chimneys off the top of the centre block. Two, two stories go with this one. And I'm thinking about Cocky Thompson. John Thompson's nickname was Cocky. Because he was pretty... He was pretty cocky. Little fella. Thought he was six foot six. And uh, we're tasked with taking all these chimney caps. And the chimney caps are eight feet by four feet by two feet thick. And in the summer of 1995, the group of masons that are... Um, hired by the federal government for repairs and um, emergency work, tried to take one of the chimney caps off. It took them all summer with a 300 ton crane sitting on the ground at 250 bucks an hour, or whatever that was, and they still broke the chimney cap in four places because they were trying to tug and pull something that had been sitting there since 1916, since they built it after the, the fire. It wasn't gonna happen, the flues reached from above the top of the chimney cap into the body of the chimney where they were gripped by the mortar between them. So what did I do? Thinking back to a trick I'd seen Cocky Thompson do, we went to the carpenters and we had them cut long shims of oak from nothing to about three-eighths of an inch. And then or all the way around the chimney caps, we tapped in these, we drilled three little tiny holes side by each and tapped these oak wedges into the holes at one foot centres 
Then we went down to the Canadian Tire, which used to be on Kent Street in Ottawa. We bought every sponge they had and every plastic sheet that they had, and we wet the sponges, wrapped the oak in the sponges, then wrapped the sponges with plastic sheeting. We come back the next morning, the oak had swelled and every chimney cap was popped. We had a crane for four hours. We had 14 chimney caps in the ground and not a chip in any one of them. Now that's thinking outside the box. That's thinking about what history tells you and what history can do for you in a modern age. The other story about centre block at Parliament Hill, it's a big high place, 70 feet to the, to the roof line, 110 to the top of the roof. Now the guys working on the chimneys, if they needed to use the washroom, had a 10 minute walk down the stairs, do their business and a 15 minute walk back up the stairs. So I was complaining loudly about this. And the guys from Public Works said, look, it's not going to happen. We're not going to build you a toilet on top of the House of Commons. And it went on for weeks. And I said, well, I said, and eventually, because it was on the, the list, and we came to a meeting one time, I said, and they said, well, and to say, and I said, well, you don't have to worry about your toilet anymore. And he said, why? I said, well, because my crew are doing what every Canadian would love to do, is piss on the House of Commons. <laughs> they started building the toilet the next morning. Not in the way you do it, it's the way you skin the cat, it makes it work. So, how did I get to Canada? Well, um, there was a, there is, the Toronto Scottish Rugby Club, and my, uh, I was standing in the bar where my wife Alison's father worked in our village, and uh, having a pint, and this guy comes up beside me, he'd been in Canada for a couple of years, and he says, oh. he said, I'm a member of the Toronto, Rugby, uh, Toronto Scottish Rugby Club, and he said, there's a guy there who runs a masonry company, he's looking for stonemasons to, to set steps building the first Canadian place with Carrara Marbles, a bunch of steps to build. Nobody seems to be able to figure out how to get it started at King Street and have it meet the door where it's supposed to meet the door. No, steps are, steps are difficult. They have to have the same travel. They have to have the same rise. If you, and all of them have to be exactly the same because if you don't, people will trip on them. And the difference of half an inch will cause a trip. So he says, how do you fancy going to Canada for a wee while? And I thought, that, geez, that sounds great. So I went home, talked to Alice, and we'd just got married. We were married in 1974. And... I said, how do you fancy going to Canada for a wee while? She said, oh, that'll be good, I think. Over we came. Worked at First Canadian Place, then worked at TD Place, then worked all over the place downtown, Peanut Plaza up in Don Mills. But at that time, and this is where things got a little skewed, at that time, they were building the big O in Montreal in readiness for the 76 Olympics. And the Masons in Toronto wanted the same money as the boys in Montreal were getting. Not about to happen, right? So they called a strike. November. We'd only been here four months. And what were we going to do? Here was I at 21, Alison at 20. Just discovered Alison was pregnant with her first boy. Were we going to go back to Scotland with her tail between her legs? Or was there something going to, a bolt come out the sky and, and hit us? And the bolt arrived in the form of a guy who was in the union, who was also Scottish. And he said, look, you're the right size. You've got the right accent. If you walk about 500 yards up Jarvis Street, you'll bump into Toronto Police Headquarters. Go and tell him you want to be a policeman. <laughs> now, I, went, I don't really want to be a policeman. He says, no, no, it's easy. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Six months training. He says, if you don't like it, you can come back to the union in the springtime and, and we'll, we'll find you a job. If you do like it, you can hang on for a while. So off I went up to Jarvis Street. <clears throat> Diff different time, believe me. Walked in through the door. Met a guy called Ron Stinson who became a friend over the years. He asked me two questions. Can you play the bagpipes? <laughs> Apparently the police pipe band were looking for pipers. Can you play the bagpipes? I said, no, but my father was the pipe major of the 2nd Battalion C4 Highlanders during the war in Burma. Tick. <laughs> he says, spell subpoena. And I, I've been always very good at spelling at school, so that was a, that was a no brainer for me. S-U-B-P-O-E-N-A, tick. Okay, you start Monday, he says. And I went from $7 an hour at the union to $12 an hour as a, as a first year policeman. So that was a pretty good start. Plus the benefits, plus all the rest of it. So I stuck around for a while. And I ended up in charge of the diving team down here at Harbour Front. And of course diving um, involves search and rescue and search and recovery more, more like it. And I lasted in the police from 1987, uh, January 1987 till March, eh, sorry, January 1975 till March 87. And um, 86 was a bad, bad year. Those of you who lived in Toronto or who, who have lived in Toronto <clears throat> will remember the two 
kids that fell into Black Creek up at Jane and Finch that year, that summer. Six-year-old went in, four-year-old brother tried to grab him. He went in also, both lost. The fire department found the six-year-old, my partner and I found the four-year-old. And um, that summer there was also Alan, Alison Perot who went missing from the Royal Bank, the last scene at the Royal Bank machine on, on uh, Bloor Street, right opposite Varsity Stadium. And Sharon Morningstar Keenan, same year, bad year for Toronto. And looking for these kids, when my kids were young as well, just did my head in. We'd call it PTSD now, probably. All the time I'd been a policeman, that 11 years I was a policeman, I'd been doing chimneys and fireplaces and extensions and building basements for other policemen. I had a great time with it. And, uh, but that was enough. Back to my trade. So I started the business in 1987. By 1991, <clears throat> we were getting kind of short on work. And I liked a comment from Brian Bomber yesterday about making your own luck. Because I kind of tried to do the same thing. And I'd heard the biggest stonemasonry company, or the biggest company that was doing stonemasonry in Toronto was and is a company called Clifford Masonry. Now, Clifford were looking for uh, a crew of masons to build the Vaughan estate at the back of Sunnybrook Hospital. Now, I knew that the, one of the partners in Clifford Masonry, a guy called Sean Costello, drank in the Irish Community Centre in the West End of Toronto. So, <clears throat> me being a bit of a singer, have been and continue to be, excuse me a minute, I uh, finagled myself a job at the Irish Community Centre singing, knowing that Sean would be there to play his usual dominoes on a Friday night. And when I saw him get up from the domino table to go to the bar, I called a break in the, in the singing and went and stood beside him at the bar. And he says, would you like a drink? And I says, I'd love a drink. So he bought me a pint. He says, what do you do? I says, I'm a stonemason. And he looked at me and he says, are you a real stonemason? Are you a bricklayer that thinks you're a stonemason? I said, no, I'm a real stonemason. He says, well, interestingly enough, I've got a job that you might be interested in. How many guys have you got? I said, we've got six. He said, okay. He said, meet me at Sunnybrook Hospital on Monday. So I truck off down to Sunnybrook Hospital with two of my most trusted guys, one of them, Tom Kelso, who also did time with John Thompson on Isle of Arne, I'd brought over from Scotland to help when things were busy. And another guy called Graham Wood, who was there to mix the mud for us. We knew we'd be asked to build a test panel. Sean shows up and says, uh, okay, there's the stone, there's where it's going, here's a concrete pad over here, build a wall here so that we can see if you know what you're doing or not. I said, well, why don't I just build the wall on the corner of the building? Okay, smart arse, build the wall over there. He says, my partner, Jimmy Reach, another Scottish guy, will be here at noon to see how you're getting on. So by 12 o'clock, we'd built a huge wall, six feet high, as much as I could reach, six feet high. Tom Kelso cutting the stone for me, I was building it, Graham mixing the mud. We had a grand time, lovely sunny day. Sean came back with his partner, Jimmy Reich, and Reich looked at the wall and he said, wow. He said, that's pretty spectacular for four hours of work. He said, where did you learn? He says, who was your master mason? Very critical. Who was your master mason? Critical question. I said, John Thompson. He says, not cocky Thompson. <laughs> I says, yes, the very same. He says, I was a boy on that move of St. James's Church. And this man had worked with John Thompson on St. James's Church. Now, when I sit, met him then, 66, 67 years old, he says, you've got the job. He says, Sean, discuss money. He jumps in the car and takes off. So Tom Kelso and I had been talking the whole time we were building. And we knew we could build this stuff for about eight bucks a foot would make us money. We knew we could make bucks, money eight bucks a foot. That was us putting the scaffold up and buying the mortar and mixing the mortar ourselves. But we kept on thinking, it's a massive, it's a big, big job. It's a massive job. We should be able to charge them more than that. So by the time these guys came back, we had talked ourselves into $11 a foot. We were going to ask for $11 a foot, and if we get knocked down, we'd accept eight. So <laughs> Sean comes over and he says, okay. He says, what do you need a foot? And I said, well, we've been talking about this a lot, Sean, and I says, we're really struggling with it. He says, look, let me make it easy. He says, I'll supply all the scaffolding and the guys to build it. And knock off a dollar, I'm down to 10. He says, and I'll supply a guy to drive the forklift, mix the mud, and bring the mud to you. Knock off another dollar, I'm down to nine. And he says, anything that goes at the back of the wall, the ties, the 
waterproofing, the damp proof courses, all of that stuff, I will buy all of that as well. I'm down to eight bucks. So I'm thinking eight bucks, thinking I'm going to be pretty good with this. I said, okay, and I hesitated just a wee bit too long, thankfully. Because he says, look, Bob, he says, I've got $18 a foot in it. The most I can give you is 14. That's all you're getting. You might as well not ask for any more. <laughs> <coughs> I'm a lucky man. We started that job in March. This was 1991. We finished it on Remembrance Day, 1991. March to November, 1991. You might not remember, I do, that we didn't lose a day to rain the whole summer. It rained every single weekend. It was called the worst summer in Toronto history because it rained every single Saturday and Sunday, but it didn't rain during the weeks. We did not lose one day to rain, and we had the job built. After that, we came to Queen's Park. And Queen's Park was a big eye-opener for me because we come on site at Queen's Park. By this time, the little crew of six has risen to eight, and we're on Queen's Park working again for Clifford Masonry, and he's got 40 other guys on the site that don't have a clue what they're doing. No idea. Brick and block layers. No idea what they're doing. We're being told to take out joints. We're being told to cut down stone walls and rebuild them. We're being told to take out um, massive cornice pieces and put new ones in. And it was a, a real problem. The architect was Carlos Venton. And Carlos Venton's uh, representative on site said, this is horrendous. Your guys are working away fine, but all of these guys know nothing. So there was a woman at Queen's Park at the time uh, called Barbara Speakman. Now, Barbara had the lovely title of Keeper of the Fabric. She was responsible for all of the historic buildings in the purview of the Ontario government. And Barbara decided to do something about it. So she phoned a, pa a, a friend at OTAB at the time and then phoned a friend at eight, what was the equivalent of HRDC and said, how would we put a training program together to train these other guys? And I said, well, easy. I said, I'll help you with it and I'll, help, I'll train it if you want. So that's what we did. We started training in, in uh, 1994 was the first class. 1994, we started training. And we were doing stuff on the site, of course, but we're doing much more of it at Durham College. After three courses at Durham College, um, I got a wee bit fed up <clears throat> with the, and I don't mean to make anybody uncomfortable here, but um, it cost an awful lot of money to run a community college. And I got a wee bit fed up with, with the money I knew was coming into the college coffers and what we were getting out the back door to, to supply the guys trying to learn. So we started our own little school called the Guild Institute of Stone and Restoration Masonry. Again, playing on the words that the, that the union had given us, Stone and Restoration Masonry. Um, and we did that from 1996 till 2000, till the, the uh, HRDC thing changed. Money went back to the provinces and we lost the funding. But in that space of time, I uh, had a hand in training about 350 people. Um, and then... Um, in 1996, the federal government approached me and said, we've got this huge project starting up at Parliament Hill. Can you come up to Parliament Hill and do the same thing there? And so I ended up in Ottawa and never left. We started in Ottawa at the centre block project. We've done, we did the East Block project. Uh, along the way, we were working for the Canadian, um, or the Commonwealth War Graves. We, we look after the war graves from one side of the country to the other, where you, the crosses are sacrificed and the cemeteries and all that kind of stuff, clean graves for them. Um, I've worked on the Washington Monument, um, been all over North America building. There are no stonemasons. When we set up the training program with the HRDC in 1994, somebody went, worked out, tried to work out how many stonemasons, registered stonemasons, proper stonemasons there were in the country. And all they could do was call the companies involved in it to try and get some sort of number. The number they came up with was about 300. And somebody also worked out that the money that was available right now in budgets already allowed for to build um, infrastructure. Now we're talking federal, provincial, universities, hospitals, schools, stonework. It would take a thousand years for the 300 guys to get the work done. That hasn't changed. The government recently announced it was going to, their $5 billion budget for the, West Block, or for the parliamentary precinct was going to go to probably $6 billion. That's only seven buildings on a hill in Ottawa. Think about all the other stone buildings that are across the country. And they all need to be treated properly. We worked at 24 Sussex, which was fun, after the Mulroney years. Um, the seat of our, our uh, Prime Minister. It was kind of 
cool being in there. Sometimes you get really neat jobs to do. Sometimes they're really bad jobs you get to do. You've got to take them with you in, in your stride. And we were doing the chimneys on the roof at 24 Sussex. And in the master bedroom, the fireplace hadn't worked forever. And so there was obviously a problem with it. And to get, to see, to get inside of a fireplace, there's only two ways to do it. You either take the breast, chimney breast off above the mantle and see what's happening, or you back yourself into the firebox <clears throat> and you reach up and dismantle all the mechanical bits on the damper. Then you poke the damper up into the smoke chamber and whatever's holding the damper falls down in your head. So sure enough, there's a, a pile of garbage up there, including a big lump of tile that nearly split my skull open. And you can't wear a hard hat in the firebox, of course. So I'm sitting in there, all this soot falling on me. I'm coughing, I'm spluttering and carrying on. I crawled out with the piece of tile that was holding the damper. And the, the uh, site superintendent for PCL says, Jesus, you look like shit. And I says, yeah, but look on the bright side. I said, from this day forward, anywhere in the world, I get to say with a straight face that I spent an afternoon in the master bedroom at 24 Sussex Drive with my head up Mila Mulroney's flu. <laughs> Mila Mulroney was a lovely looking woman in these days. <laughs> they haven't done any more work to it since. Um, but we've done, uh, we've done some incredible work over the years and, and uh, it, onto the West Block now after all, after all of this stuff. We got involved a little bit with the Montreal Mafia, which was a tough time for us in 2010. And it, I, I don't carry business cards. Um, so if you want to Google me, just Google Bobby Watt. And it's not B, it's not I, it's B-O-B-B-Y, -B Bobby Watt. And a whole bunch of stuff will come up, including front page photographs from the, from the, uh, the Globe and Mail and the Montreal's La Presse and things like that. Because there was a bit of jiggery-pookery going on with the Montreal um, mob that resulted in the Charbonneau Commission. And we get sort of brought into it because we had been brought in to finish a job that a Montreal company had originally got at the West Block and made a mess of. And uh, we were, um, well, it was pretty nasty, pretty nasty stuff. But you know the way they price jobs in Montreal? We, we could, when we do construction work, we, we price jobs normally. You put the job number in and you go and see the stuff. So there's a big story about the, the Scotsman, the Englishman and the Quebecer that went to Montreal City Hall to talk about a project they'd all bid on. And they're sitting outside the hallway from the public works guy and he calls in the English guy first. And he says to the English guy, he says, now tell me what your price is for this little project. And the English guy says, well, it'll be $9,000. So the public works guy says, well, how do you figure that? He says, well, it'll be 3,000 for materials, 3,000 for time, 3,000 for overhead and profit. The guy goes, oh, that's not bad, okay, fine. He says, on your way out, send the Scotsman in. So the Scotsman comes in bit more talented than the English guy. <laughs> and the guy says, how much do you want for the, for the little job? And the Scotsman says, um, well, it'd be $12,000. He says, uh, 4,000 for materials, 4,000 for labor, and 4,000 for overhead and profit. The guy goes, well, you're a wee bit high. He says, but it's all right. On your way out, send the Quebecer in. So the Quebecer comes in, sits himself down, lights himself a cigarette, and the public works guy says, uh, so how much do you need for the, for the project? And the guy says, $27,000. And the public works guy goes, how the hell do you figure that out? He says, well, there's 9,000 for you, 9,000 for me, we'll give the job to the Englishman. <laughs> Not that far from the truth, believe me. <laughs> so this job at the West Block is, is astounding. It's, it's the biggest, oh man, it's, it's certainly the, the, the apex of my career. It's the biggest restoration, stonemasonry restoration project going on in the world at the moment. Um, we had over 200 guys just past Christmas time, guys and women. On the crew, we have about uh, just over 10% of the, of the people actually on the wall. There's 163 or 65 people on the wall actually working. Um, and of them, 18 are women. And they are astounding. One of our best stone carvers is a woman. And we're going to, because I've said that now, it triggers me back to the levels of stonemasonry. So if you start, if you go with a, your basic mason, knows how to go into a quarry, pick stone out of the ground, cut it and square it, and build it on a wall. Simple as that. And he can do it with dry stone, meaning with no mortar, or he can do it with mortar. The next level up is stone cutter. 
Now, these are guys who take what we call freestone, and this is where the term Freemason came from, by the way, just as an aside. Freestone is stone that doesn't have visible sedimentary lines. Royal York Hotel, perfect example. Um, Union Station, built with Indiana limestone. You look at that stuff, it looks like cheese. There are no lines in it. So the stone cutters are the guys who shape that stuff with fancy little detailing, carve the columns, carve the lovely acanthus leaves at the top, make roll mouldings, do all of that kind of stuff. So they're, they've been trained as stonemasons, now they're stone cutters. And then from stone cutter you go to stone carver. And stone carver is a stone cutter who also has an artistic ability to be able to see how to transform a lump of very hard and unforgiving material into a beautiful gargoyle or grotesque or sculpture. So these levels of stonemasonry, it's amazing to me that the people who actually, you know that stonemasonry was, was probably the second oldest trade in the world, right? And stonemasons guilds from the 13th century, stonemasons guilds were the genesis for our modern unions, right? And this, these clubs, these guys had to protect themselves from bad employers. Sounded like such a great idea. All the other highfalutin guys in the towns and villages thought, we should have a club like that as well. What are we going to call ourselves? I oh, know, let's call ourselves the Freemasons. Because we're not involved in practical masonry, but we want to belong to a club that helps protect its members from outside negative influences. So let's call it Freemasonry. Still alive today. And it just amazes me in North America where there's lots of Freemasons and lodges and there's lots of people doing stone masonry that none of the legislative, um, the 13 districts across the country actually regist registers or recognizes stone masonry as an actual trade. So that's my next goal, is getting that done. Hopefully I'll get that done before I die. Pat Blackwood's gonna help me. Where was I going with that? The women. I'll encourage you to go to our website, Romeo Juliet Whiskey Golf Echo Mother dot com, rjwgem dot com. In there, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff, but you'll see um, video links to a little series of videos that we're doing about the project. So number one tells you about the project. Number two talks about apprenticeship. Number three and four talks about the materials. Number five talks about the women and the crew, and they're quite a bunch. I'm going to have to switch this mic off again so I can cough. <coughs> Colleen Wilson, who is our head carver on site, has studied initially in Vancouver, has gone all around the country and into the States to learn more about stone carving and sculpture. And she's just an incredibly positive influence on, on the younger women in the crew. And the whole point of the, the videos, and that video in particular, is to try and get more women into the into the business, because it's not all big, rough, tough guys. A lot, there's a lot of big, rough, tough guys, don't get me wrong, but the women have a better handle on the finite, you know, the finite stuff that needs to be really zeroed in on. The creating leaves with dental tools, filling tiny, tiny holes with, with injectionable um, grout to solidify stones. The women have a way of focusing. They don't have to be running up and down the scaffold and humping big lumps of stone about. They're incredible in the system that we're in. And of the 63 apprentices on the site, about 12 of them are women. So it's about 20%. That's not too bad. We'd like to get it better than that, but it's not too bad. I'll be really interested in seeing the next talk, actually, the women in the trades, because I'm really looking forward to that one. So, and we find that in our, in our crews at Parliament Hill, a lot of our crews are musicians, a lot of them. Probably 40, 50% of the guys play music or they paint or they write poetry. Some of them even write books. So stonemasonry is an incredible artistic endeavor. I know it's great, and I'm not slagging the other trades, I know it's great to push a lever and the yellow water in the bowl goes away and the white water comes back. That's cool, I get it, and I get that when you switch that light on over there, 40 light bulbs in the ceiling all go bing. I get that, that's cool. But it's, nobody, nobody writes poetry about that shit. <laughs> I 
a guy called Antoine de saint Exploré was a great writer. He was actually a pilot, test pilot, first guy to fly over the Andes in a mail run. Um, and Antoine de saint Exploré wrote, wrote a book in 1944 called Flight to Arras. And in it he says, a pile of rock is just a pile of rock until any person views it who bears within themselves the image of a cathedral. Lovely, eh? John Ruskin, the famous philosopher and designer and architect in Victorian times said, when we build, let us think that we build forever. Let us build in the sure and certain knowledge that there is a time to come when these stones will be held sacred because our hands have touched them. You don't get electricians getting stuff like that written about. <laughs> <coughs> I feel sorry for them, but it just doesn't happen. The youngest tradesman in our crew is Danny Govro. He's 23 years old. You'll see him in, in, uh, in video number two. You'll see Danny Govro in video number two along with the other guy called Tevin, Kevin Tovey. But Danny Govro is the youngest tradesman on the site. He started his apprenticeship at 18 as soon as he left high school. And that is my message today. Let's get them right out of high school. Let's get into the high schools and let's make sure that they know that we are available for them. I spend a lot of time talking to the Catholic school board and the, and the Ottawa District School Board and, and people up there have a real joy of, of sending me young people to, to, to train. It's great. I love it. I love this relationship. Two of the people that uh, Minister Jason Kennedy are going to, are going to he's going to meet on the 19th. Um, uh, my friend and, and colleague now, Nabina Robinson, has set up this tour on Parliament Hill. We're bringing Jason Kenny and a couple of other people in. Two of the people that he will meet that day are kids that came from the school board. They came to work in the shop. Now, we haven't taken everyone that comes to work in the shop because we make them clean the toilets and we make them clean the floor. We make them clean out the pit under the big saws. And if they show, if they exhibit the right attitude, boom, you're mine. If they complain or whine or dick around, we send them back after, after their six weeks, send them back, thanks very much. We'll not talk about him. Attitude is everything. It's absolutely everything. We have this situation up there. We have a, this, this massive, massive job has many facets. There's some really nice stuff. We, we took down the Laurier Tower right to the ground and rebuilt it. Now it's called the Laurier Tower because Sir Wilfrid Laurier was in the Prime Minister's chair at the time. But the Public Works Department in 1905, when this was being built, um, were shoving and shoving and shoving to get the thing up before winter time. And the mortar froze before it had a chance to set. And so come spring, when the mortar thawed, the tower came crashing down, luckily with no loss of life. And of course, the Conservatives thought it was a great thing to happen. <laughs> tower fell down. He was the Prime Minister, obviously his fault. So it's called the Laurier Tower. We rebuilt that Laurier Tower, but inside the courtyard, there have been many, many things done over the years in the courtyard. And one of the things they did was they, they formed a concrete wall against one side of the courtyard and poured concrete between the earth and the stonework. Instead of taking, the stone was destabilizing. Instead of, instead of taking the stone down, they poured the concrete against it. Short way around, cheaper way around, sure, all of these things. Nothing to do with finesse. But I came across, one day I, I came across one of our best stone cutters in a hole, cutting concrete off that wall with a 705, Hilti 705, which is a big, big machine. And he's cutting away and he's cutting away and he's cutting away. And I said, God, it's daily, what are you doing in there? He says, well, it's, it's got to be done. He says, the kids were having trouble with it. with two apprentices in the hole with them. And I said, okay, well, thanks, buddy. Walked away. Next day I come back around my rounds again. And he's in the same hole, doing the same thing. I said, Daly, for goodness sake, can we not find somebody to give you a spell at least? He said, it's okay, Bob. It's my second brick boat. I almost wept. All these years. He, he's been with me for 14 years. He heard the story about the brick boats in his very first year. 14 years later, he throws it back at me. It's okay, Bob. It's my second brick boat. That's attitude. That's an attitude you can take and run with. And you could take a kid like that and show him the moon and he'll get there. And I'm absolutely positive. Lots of our apprentices have started their own companies and every small town in Ontario needs a stonemason, a good one. Every single one. 
The programme at Algonquin is doing a great job of giving them their, their grounding of what they need to do, to, what they need to understand to be good stonemasons. It's my job to take them from there and show them other, the other stuff they need to know. Same with bricklayers. We can take bricklayers in and show them only if they have the right attitude. If they think they know everything, if they think they're already stonemasons, I don't want them. If you know you're a brick and block layer and you want to know how to cut and build stone, I'll be glad to show you. But you show me the attitude first before I do. How are we doing for time? Five minutes. <coughs> um, artistic ability. A knowledge of architecture, a knowledge of engineering, a knowledge of art history, an eye for beauty, an eye for form. All of these things you need in some measure to be a good stonemason. You also need to know that if you've done something wrong or not completely right, it needs to come down and go back up again. And that has cost me a lot of money over the years, but it's also what's made our, rep our reputation. And you think that coming out of school at 18, people can't understand these things? Of course they can. We've got some very talented kids in this province. We just have to find the ones that want to, want to be tradespeople. And we have to find the ones that need to want to grow within themselves to understand what it feels like to, to be a part of something like that. And back to Danny Govro. At 23 years old, I keep saying to him, Danny, you're a lucky man just like me. Because 50 years from now, you'll be able to bring your grandkids past the West Block and show them this window that you've reconstructed. But not many people get to be able to do that. A lot of stuff gets covered up. Stonemasonry stuff doesn't get covered up. We need to be very proud of what we do. We need to be very conscious of what we do. And we need to be conscious also of what we're leaving to the next generations. And that's the important thing for us. Attitude, attitude, attitude. Now, just to show you that 16-year-olds can think of really wonderful things, I'll tell you another little story, kind of unrelated. One of the uh, foremost Freemasons in Scotland was a guy called Robert Burns. And Robert Burns, when he was 16 years old, of course, this is the guy that wrote Old Lang Syne, one of the finest poets and songwriters the world has ever known. And when Robert Burns was 16 years old, he was sitting in a schoolroom in Ayrshire in southwest Scotland. And it's August. And he's looking out the window, and it's harvest time. And there's a girl of his own age bent over at the waist with a sickle, what we call a huck in Scotland. And she's cutting the corn and stacking it, tying it with binder twine. And he's looking at her bent over, sweating in the sun. And all thoughts of mathematics just disappear from his head. He was a bit of a guy for the girls, was Robert. And he wrote this poem. And I'm going to end with a poem. Why do I end with a poem? That's actually a poem song. Just to show you that art and hard work can live together in the same craggly handsome guy. <laughs> now whistling winds and slaughtering guns bring autumn's pleasant weather. The moorcock springs and whirring wings among the blooming heather. Now waving grain wide o'er the plain delights the weary farmer, and the moon shines bright as I rove by night to muse upon my charmer. The patrick loves the fruitful fells, the plover loves the fountains, the woodcock haunts the lonely dells, and the soaring hern the mountains. Through lofty groves the cushat roves, the path of man to shun it, and the hazel bush o'erhangs the thrush, the spreading thorn, the linnet. And thus every kind their pleasure find, the savage and the tender. Some social join and leagues combine, some solitary wander. Avant away the cruel sway, the running man's dominion. The sportsman's joy, the murdering cry, the fluttering gory pinion. But Peggy dear, the evening's clear, thick flies, the skimming swallow. The sky is blue, the fields in view, all fading green and yellow. Come let us stray our gladsome way, 
and view the charms of nature, the rustling corn, the fruited thorn, and Elka, happy creature. Thank you. <laughs>